What's up everybody, in today's video we're going to be reviewing the book Why Good People Do Bad Things by Debbie Ford. And if you've read or watched any of my other content, you know that I'm a big fan of Debbie Ford. Now Debbie Ford is well known for shadow work and her most popular book is Dark Side of the Light Chasers, which I covered on my channel here before. I've also read her book Spiritual Divorce, which is about in the spiritual side of the divorce process or more of the dealing with the emotions that come from the divorce. So make sure to check out those videos as well. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, Debbie Ford passed away from cancer, but she has a ton of books, so there's still plenty of content to read. In them. And I saw this book in the library and I decided to check it out. Plus, I thought it was also a good book to review, considering current times of political correctness and all the things that's going around, like Harvey Weinstein and all these people that are doing bad things and we don't understand why they're doing them. And that's really what I like about this book too, is, is the stories behind the book of real people and the terrible things that they've done in their lives. And it's they're doing them because of this two-sidedness of each of us. And we don't know how to deal with that, those two sides of ourselves. And when we don't deal with those two sides of ourselves, then bad things can happen. Now this book isn't as good as her other books. I don't think this book is like, has some concepts in it that aren't really that clear but it's still pretty good to understand shadow work. Now I'll start with chapter one. Chapter one is called the beach ball effect. And the reason it's called the beach ball effect is because you're supposed to create this mental picture of taking a beach ball, going into a swimming pool and like trying to hold the beach ball underwater. Like the harder you push down, the more likely it is to like pop up and just like burst in your face. And this is the same thing with the negative things in our life or the negative emotions or emotions that we get from not expressing ourselves. The more we store those emotions up in ourselves, the more likely they are to come out in a bad way. And some things she talks about in this chapter is like things like sexual desires. You're not supposed to talk about your sexual desires in society today. You're supposed to keep that pinned up. And this is exactly what happened to Harvey Weinstein, right? He was seen as this big time producer and you just weren't supposed to say anything about it. And he didn't talk about it. He probably didn't express his sexuality appropriately with his wife. And then it burst out into all these different situations that he got himself into. And he just blew his life up. The examples she gives are examples of Don Imus and Mel Gibson. And if you remember Don Imus, he said a racial slur. And it's probably some, some things he had pent up. And then Mel Gibson said terrible things to his wife or fiance, I forget what she was but he just said terrible racist things as well. Now let's go on to chapter two. Chapter two is called The Split. And this is a chapter where Debbie starts explaining why we do these bad things. It's not our evolved self, she says, that does this. It's our shamed personas. She speaks a lot about shame-based personas in this book. And this is where our egos try to sabotage us and create a false self. An example she gives here is Catholic priests denying themselves sexually and then sexually assaulting children. And in order to in order to fight against this, she says that humans have to realize that we're not all good or all bad. We have two sides to ourselves and we have to accept and integrate those two sides. And like this and this is where she provides like a, a cool metaphor that I never heard before that I thought was pretty cool. And she says it's like this Native American story of a white wolf and a black wolf. And then one is obviously good and one's bad. And it's this older Native American man speaking to a younger Native American person. And the younger one said, asks, which wolf wins? Because it's a tale of how they fight. And he said, neither wins. They fight back and forth and they win back and forth. It's consistent how they win and lose. Because he says if the white wolf wins too much, then the black wolf waits around every corner until the white wolf is tired and just completely attacks it. And that's supposed to be a metaphor before for our good side and dark side. If you spend too much time building up your good persona and denying the things that society calls dark or shameful, then the more powerful than that, that shame-based persona gets and wants to act out to get attention. And this moves, this moves us to chapter three, which is called the seesaw. And she says here, is, seesaw is obviously back and forth, right? And she says it's a mistake to think that we are the same person all the time. They are we consistently happy, good people, always wanting to do good things, always wanting to do the right thing. And she says that what many people do is they believe that the good resides in them and the bad resides in others. 
and they project the bad things about themselves onto other people. And she covered this in Dark Side of the Light Chasers. The things that you see in other people, the bad things, are actually the bad things inside of yourself. Because you won't even really be aware of them unless you've seen them in yourself or unless somebody's taught you about them about yourself. And the way we adapt to this is we use various things to cope with shoving this stuff down inside of us. We use things like food, people, drugs, collecting stuff, anything that can distract us, watching TV. We use this to deal with how we keep all these things deep inside of us. And she goes into more detail about this in the denial chapter. The next chapter we're going to discuss is chapter four, Shame on You. And this is, this chapter is all about how we shame ourselves. An unprocessed shame is what makes us sabotage ourselves. It makes us sabotage our success. And this often happens because we reach a level of success in our lives that feels uncomfortable to us and uncomfortable based on our past. So we feel that we have to return to normal, which is not being successful. And then we end up sabotaging ourselves. And in order to quit doing this to yourself, you have to deal with your past. And she reiterates this a lot in the book. And Debbie gives an example of a baseball player who earned millions of dollars, but he ended up sabotaging himself and doing drugs because of his past. In his past, he wasn't used to all this success. He wasn't used to having millions of dollars. And, and this happens a lot with sports players, right? Especially in the NFL, where they have a certain past. It's not, it's not the best and it's rough, yet they get these million dollar contracts and they still sabotage themselves because they're not familiar with success. And they don't think they deserve it. And to me, in this time period we're in right now, what it brought up to me was Aaron Hernandez, because the Aaron Hernandez documentary just came out. And Aaron Hernandez played for the New England Patriots, which were winning Super Bowls. He had enough, tens of millions of dollars from his contracts that were due to be paid to him. But he ended up murdering people, or allegedly ended up murdering people because he didn't deal with all the shame that he had. The documentary said that, you know, he might have been a homosexual, but they don't know, or a bisexual at least. And then they, all, they also mentioned his family life. His dad died when he was young, and then his mom immediately welcomed another man into the home who was a spouse of a family member. So there's a lot of shame in there, a lot of things that, a lot of emotions that he had to deal with that he didn't. And it ends up coming out as sabotaging yourself. And she says that pain and shame are the two main catalysts in life. Tony Robbins says this as well, that if you're not making a change in your life that you want to, it's because you haven't experienced enough pain from it. And we are taught shame from when we are children. And then she also, she mentions the story of her son and her son lied to her. And she wanted to teach her son to not lie to her. But also she realizes that there's another side. That sometimes lying is okay. And the example she provides is like, think of a pedophile or a dangerous person coming up and talking to her son and asking her, asking him a personal question. Then she would want her son to lie, you know, maybe to tell this guy that an adult was close by or something like that. And, but she says this programming of, of shame and negative things in our, our head comes from when we're children and we're taught shame as children. People teach us shame throughout our childhood. And she says that the message that something was wrong with you was programmed to you thousands of times before you even turn 10 years old. And then she says, what happens is we internalize this and then we end up building a shame body inside of ourselves. And this shame body is unconscious and it's automated software that's like constantly trying to sabotage you if you haven't worked on your past. And it, and it all happens, it, and this happens to all of us. We stop living in our limitless possibilities and then we just limit ourselves based on our shame-based persona that we're not good enough. And then she goes on to talk about there's healthy shame and then there's unhealthy shame. And the healthy shame that we feel or that we trigger in ourselves is good. It lets us know that we're operating within our boundaries. For example, if you eat bad or you eat, if you're eating something bad or you consistently eat bad, and then you feel shame because you're not operating in a healthy mindset. She says our feelings of shame are the source of all of our self-sabotage because she says shame could be either good or bad because she says sometimes we're afraid of being not only bad, but also great. So we sabotage ourselves. We feel shame from being great. Maybe our family member don't like that we're doing well in life. And so what you'll do is you sabotage yourself. So you limit your success or you'll shame yourself telling yourself you're not good enough. And then you'll just limit the things you work on. So this chapter is all about 
how shame leads to self-sabotage. Now we're moving on to chapter five, and chapter five is the fallout of fear. And then she says the fear comes from like not the fear of not being accepted for our whole selves. We're not gonna be accepted for the the two-sidedness that we have. That we have sexual desires, that we have desires for money, that we have desires to look good, things like that. So we start covering it up. And we cover it up so that we can be accepted. And what we do is we turn away from our imperfections and then we believe that they're just gonna go away. But when you disown this side of yourself, when you disown this imperfect side of yourself, what happens is you're actually disowning a part of who you are, of your total humanity. And that's not really natural. And in your, in your fear-based thoughts that we have create toxic emotions. And then she lists out toxic emotions that you might have. The toxic emotions that Debbie discusses are hurt, hopelessness, sadness, anger, jealousy, and hate. She got, she describes each one of these and like the impact they might have. For example, for her, she says hurt carries great lessons with us. But if we're hurt, that's often times when we want to hurt other people. And then for anger, she says, many of us live in denial of actually how much anger we have in our life. And I think I identified with that a lot too, because sometimes I just feel angry about, you know, why aren't things a certain way? But you have to like go back and process why you're feeling all that anger. What part of yourself did you disown? Maybe you're angry because, maybe you're angry because somebody else is doing better than you or something like that. And that's really rooted in not feeling good enough. And you really shouldn't be doing that comparison. You should be accepting your whole self. You should be accepting your whole self and living in the present moment. Chapter six is called The Ego Gone Bad. In this chapter, she talks about the our regular ego versus the wounded ego. She says like our regular ego or a good ego, if you want to call it that, is it supports us. It lets us establish boundaries and assert ourselves in situations where we need to. A healthy ego motivates us to go to college, to think of having a good job, and then to want to get that good job. And then once we get in that good job, climb the corporate ladder. But then the wounded ego in that situation starts working at the corporation and thinks, hey, there's other people that want to do the same thing as me. Maybe I'm not good enough to make it. Maybe I won't make it to the top. And what this, this is a wounded ego speaking. And the wounded ego is constantly contrasting and comparing to others. If you're constantly comparing to others, this is likely your wounded ego that's working there. And it's, she says the wounded ego is less than its divine counterpart, which is the higher self. And she says that it's this higher self that you should use to help you make decisions. Chapter seven is cracking the code of the false self. And this is this is where she goes, this chapter is where she goes more into like the false side of ourselves that we end up creating and how it drains us. The more shame we felt as children, the more separated we are from our true selves. And then she provides a and then she provides a story of her own personal life of her and her sister. And her sister was really smart and she didn't like that. She felt like she was gonna miss out on attention. So what she ended up doing is creating this false persona that wanted to be similar to that. And what she ended up doing, is she ended up showing herself as arrogant and like overconfident to make up for her feeling less than her sister. And she says, we all do the same thing. We all begin this lifelong process of trying to become somebody that we really aren't. And the trauma that you experienced in your childhood whatever it was, you develop the opposite attribute of that to cover it up. Or you develop an attribute that you believe will get you the attention that you want. For example, if you are ignored as a child, then you're more likely to, ve to develop a personality of somebody that's constantly seeking attention so that you'll get that attention you never got as a child. And she's like, they might seem like, these might seem like little masks that you put on, but they actually become prisons that we lock ourselves in. We believe every time we do something, we have to be that person that we created. And after this, she like lists a bunch of like really cool shame statements that she believes people might be using in their lives. And I'll just give an example of one. One shame statement is, I am damaged. I am a total loser. And I cover it up by being a corporate trainer and a motivational speaker. And that's how shame statements are structured. It's a negative thing that you felt as a child and then what you're doing currently to cover it up. This is the part of the book where she kind of loses me because right now we have too many things going on. There's like shame, fear, false personas. And it's just like all these things that create uh, the dark side of ourselves. And it's kind of hard to keep track at this point in the book of like which one of what we're supposed to do. Like, are we supposed to fix our past 
and that gets rid of our shame-based persona or are we going to be constantly living with the shame-based persona or are we constantly living with this dark side do we have to integrate every part of our the dark side of our of our being or is it just like the parts that aren't so dark this is the part of the book where i was like I was, I was just getting lost with all that information but with that we'll head to the next chapter chapter eight which is the masks and this is where she really starts identifying like all the masks that you might be covering up your dark side with and she breaks them down into like two basic categories predator and prey you're either to cover up your shame-based persona you're either a predator which means like you're attacking other people or you're taking advantage of them in some way or you're prey like you're being a victim you're letting other people do bad things to you because that's just the role you're identified with and then after that she goes on to present a list of the types of masks you might be wearing and i'll just cover a few of them which i think people might be more aware of for example the depressive in this case you're prey you're constantly depressed and you're hoping to get attention from being depressed the loner and this is being a victim too you have to be alone what this means is you don't have to feel any pain from meeting with people the overachiever the overachiever is trying to trying to get fulfillment that they never got as a child trying to get happiness and emotions they never got a child by stacking up accomplishments another one that i identified with not personally but people in my family is the martyr this is where you just do everything, bend over backwards. And you're actually, that one's more like predator because you do so much that you expect something in return or you don't want people to like step on the things that you do. You just do way too much and you hope people feel sorry for you for how much you do. Then again, you get a passive aggressive or you get actually really mad when people try and take away the things that you like to do because then they're trying to take away your attention or your power or your control. Each one of these in the chapter is really good. It has a challenge and an antidote. Basically what you have to do to not let any of these wreck your life. And, and again, this chapter was a little bit confusing because I felt like a lot of these, she has a ton of them in there. I don't think she needed to put that many and I feel like a lot of them overlap. And so then we move on to chapter nine. Chapter nine is waking up from denial. And she says that I, I really like this chapter. I feel like the denial chapter is really good. And she says that denial, and she says that denial is what numbs us from feeling the pain in our lives. And, and I, I think about this a lot in, in my life, not just personally, but just viewing other people because a lot of times I'll look at people, maybe judging, whatever you want to call it, but I'll look at people and I'll be like, how long can that person keep up that bad behavior? But then I think about it and I'm like, well, they can keep it up for the rest of their life, right? If they're in denial, they don't know they do it. Like you think about people that are really obese or overweight They've gotten that way because they just haven't stopped their bad behavior. And a lot of people will die from obesity and things like that. But it's, that's how bad denial is. That's why you have to, you don't have to constantly analyze yourself because then you can just encounter analysis paralysis. But you have to look at, at least somewhat into your, your behaviors and why you're doing them. Otherwise you can live in denial in these terrible states for the rest of your life. She says that denial is what blinds us from our own destructive nature. And there are three actions of denial hide justify and dismiss it and then she tells a story about this lady who she had a husband and her, her husband emptied out her bank account she let him take over the bank accounts and she didn't feel right but she ended up let, do, letting him do it anyway and then he emptied out the bank accounts and this is just a case of being in a marriage and you're supposed to trust this person and then just end up doing a terrible thing to you but there's also probably signs there that you just chose to ignore and then she provides some phrases that you might say to yourself if you're in denial and that's another thing i like about this book is that she provides examples of things where you might be destructive to yourself and some of those statements are i'll deal with this later i have everything under control and i don't have time so you might be saying those things when you're in denial about certain behaviors so just try and catch yourself if you say things like that and then she goes to examples of like how bad denial can be and i really like these examples that she provides she provides michael jackson like you gotta remember Michael Jackson was sleeping with children in his bed and he was in denial that that was bad behavior because you know he would go in the public and speak about how there's nothing wrong with it but also the parents of the children had to be in denial because you're letting a grown man sleep with children in your bed and that's this is bad behavior this is not behavior that's normal no matter what they say right but like people didn't step forward he didn't step forward in a minute and then the parents of these children didn't admit it and she, that's what she says about denial. We have to do more in our lives to confront our own denial, but other people's. Otherwise, we're in denial of what they're doing. If we don't say anything, we're in denial. 
And, but I, to me, personally, I think there's a balancing act. You can't just go out calling people on their stuff all the time because then it just takes an emotional toll on you from just calling people out. But an example she provides of how to do this is you got to think of somebody like Martin Luther King. He spoke out against racism and he did it in, a, in an appropriate way. So that's just an example you could use of how to confront denial. She also provides like a good saying in this chapter of, of a way of like how we destroy ourselves, you know, with denial, but also shame and all these things. And she says, we put people in prison for physical abuse, but we don't put people in prison for emotional abuse. But if we did, think of like how much time you would serve for punishing yourself. And to me, that was just like something I identified with because it is true, like emotional abuse destroys so many lives lives of children, but like also people just destroy themselves and they don't achieve the things that they could achieve if they had a better mindset. And then chapter 10 is healing the split. This is obviously the split of the wounded ego and the healthy ego. And she says that, that the healing process is the same, whether you're a predator or prey. And this involves love, bringing love and compassion to your life. And then she also provides how to heal yourself by showing the destructive side and then the antidote to the destructive side. And for the destructive side, she says there's seven patterns. And those seven patterns are guardedness, greed, arrogance, intolerance, self-absorption, stubbornness, and deceit. And the opposite to those are vulnerability, generosity, humility, compassion, being of service, willingness, and integrity. So if you want to, to heal your self-destructive side, those are the things you have to go to. For example, if you're an introvert, or you're a loner, you have, to, you have to be vulnerable to people to let them in in your life and to grow your relationships. And stubbornness, she says a lot of people don't admit that stubborn is a bad habit, but it is. In order to overcome it, you have to be willing. So that's pretty much chapter 10, just destructive side, and then how to combat this side. And chapter 11 is strength of forgiveness. And this chapter is exactly what it sounds like, is being able to forgive in order to like overcome the bad things that happen to us. We have to forgive ourselves from our own imperfections, we have to forgive other people. We have to forgive God. She has a whole section in here about forgiving God because a lot of us do blame God for the bad things that have happened to us. And you have to admit that. And that's like a big part of healing as well. She says some like really great things in this chapter. Like she says that you will create blocks to your success if you don't forgive yourself or others because you'll just like constantly hold on to these things and you won't let them go and you won't make progress because your mind's like constantly chewing on these things or you feel wrong. And another thing, another great thing she says in here is like, until we forgive ourselves, we'll continue to seek punishment. And she's like, have you ever heard the saying, the guilty seek punishment? The guilt we feel in our subconscious registers with ourselves, like it registers. And if we feel like we're guilty and we still deserve punishment, then we'll go out and punish ourselves. We are all built in with this process to be able to self punish ourselves. And if you don't forgive yourself, then you'll be constantly tearing yourself apart. You have to forgive yourself in order to stop punishing yourself. There's another good story in this chapter that she said that she used to do at seminars where she would bring like this doll in and she would like smash it crazily against the chair. And then she tells people, you wouldn't do this to a child or you wouldn't do this to anything else. But this is what we do to ourselves personally when we beat ourselves up. And I think that's true for a lot of us, right? If we do something wrong or we feel ashamed or we feel bad or stupid, and we just beat ourselves up to hopefully prevent ourselves from doing it in the future. But we have to stop this pattern of self-punishment. Now with the last chapter, chapter 12, returning to love. And this whole chapter is just all about utilizing love to overcome the bad things that we do and the internal struggles and internal pains that we feel. And she says, do you really want to let the things in your past rule your future? No, you have to love and you have to forgive yourself. And then she, gave an example, which I think kind of summed up this book and just explained this book a little bit better to me. She provided a summary of all her dark side traits and how they benefited her in her life. She says that her addiction brought her to her knees. Her fear of being lazy gives her her drive. It's her vanity that dresses her in the morning. It's her fear of being a negligent person that allows her to be a responsible parent and allows her to share up, show up for her kids. And lastly, it's her greed that leads her to work more. And I mean, it's sad because she's dead, but I think that part of the, the book really explained the rest of the book. Like it's, you have these dark side traits that we all want to believe don't exist, like greed, vanity, but they're part of who we are and you just have to better integrate them and just forgive yourself for not being perfect all the time. That's the way I think of this book. So that's my summary of why good people do bad things 
I'll include my write-up summary that I included on my website in the description to this video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe if you like the content. Thanks for watching.